So to that end, we are very lucky. Uh, we've been doing these for a long time, and we kind of have a secret guest superstar in our own midst. And our senior vice president and CTO, Sanjay Sood, who runs all of CDW's IT, he's responsible not only for all day-to-day -day operations and security, but the strategic direction of where we're headed from all of our systems. And you heard Jill and I yesterday chatting about how important those systems are to customer experience, your experience with us, and how you can define that experience for your clients. He has that responsibility for our entire company. So that said, he has an incredibly deep background, over 12 patents, a PhD, He's involved in the community here in Chicago, and his depth of knowledge, specifically in AI, is absolutely fantastic. So, welcome to the stage, Sanjay Sood. Come on up. Welcome to my house, baby, take control now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Chris. What, a, what an introduction. Um, so I'm Sanjay Sood, as Chris said, I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer at CDW. Um, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, technology, digital transformation, and moving to the edge. And by the edge, I'm not talking about edge computing, IoT, I'm really talking about the edge of the organization. Uh, and all the conversations that you, know, you guys have been having over the last few, few months around generative AI um, you know, is woven into this because it's really an accelerant of that move to the edge. And we've seen this over many years. And if you take a look you know, at the evolution of IT, right, and this is a, you know, a bit of a tongue-in-cheek slide, but you know, the evolution has always been how do you get technology into more people's hands. So starting back in the day, and I see enough people here with gray hair who remember the mainframe days, uh, you know, IT technology was completely centralized and siloed. You know, only those companies, the, the government, who had really deep pockets, had a lot of investment, could have computers, right? Those were sitting in servers, rooms. Uh, there were only a few people who knew how to operate it. Um, and essentially, it was a very, very expensive endeavor with a very, very high barrier to entry, right? And now with everything, with technology, there's tons of progress, Moore's Law, uh, innovations in terms of software programming, education, you get to client server. So here you see more capability and, and technology being moved outside of those server rooms. So the, the few people in the organization who knew how to use technology uh, started having to support technology that was deployed to more coworkers. So you have personal computing. You have desktops being put on uh, desks in an office. Uh, you have the invention of the graphical user interface. You know, this is all a bit of a history lesson, but you see increased accessibility to technology. More people get it because you ultimately believe that technology in the hands of people who are doing the work makes them more productive, makes them more efficient, gives them superpowers. Then something happens, a big step change uh, with the internet. And here you have uh, modernizations in network. You see huge paradigm shifts in the way information is shared and stored, right? And that's why many of us are probably in this room because we saw a huge gold rush in terms of being able to impact organizations by leveraging technology to making them more productive. And the internet was one of those huge step changes. Um, you started seeing online marketplaces, companies like eBay, Amazon, you see real-time collaboration, the things that we're supporting for our coworkers today um, and customers. Um, and then you saw a huge revolution in mobile. Everybody's got a mobile phone now. That was probably one of the biggest accelerators of the technical economy in the last 10 years was mobile. And then you get into cloud, right? And it's a kind of a, a steady state of, of moving this technology. So starting with the mainframe, you see this small hub in the middle. You start seeing some spokes with, um, with client server architectures. And then you start seeing what we resembles a hub and spoke with, with the cloud, right? And what that really means is you have essential technology teams that manages, supports, but ultimately the goal is how do you enable the organization with technology? How do you put it into the edge of the organization? So those people who are closest to the work, where the rubber hits the road, have that technology that makes them more capable to serve their customers um, and their industries. So with the cloud, you get dynamic scale, you get SaaS, you get developer platforms, you get things like no code and low code. So all of a sudden, it's not just software engineers building programs, building capability. You have people in your finance organization, in your HR organization, in manufacturing, who are all now asking, saying, hey, look, we're developers. We have capability. Can you give us those tools? Can you give us Power BI? Can you give us Tableau? We want to program because ultimately, we understand the business. We are there day to day. We know how technology can be leveraged. And IT, we just need you to support us. We want those tools. And so you have all this capability, all this infrastructure that allows that acceleration. 
if you zoom out, you see human progress, technology progress, starting you know, World War II, you could even go back, um, and you see essentially this steady progress. And so if you zoom out fast enough, it looks like this you know, nice steady slope up. But inside, um, you see these things called S-curves, right? And the S-curves are essentially these accelerations where you start kind of at the bottom, you do this big acceleration up, and then you plateau. And between World War II and today, we've seen countless of these mini S-curves that have happened during this time. And I you know, previewed a, a few of them on the previous slide. The invention of electricity, the combustion engine, the telephone, the internet, the, um, the microchip. You see all these little innovations that have happened over time. And those take you in terms of where you are today and accelerate you in a step change up to new capability. If you take a lack, the last couple of years, you know, we're all on the hangover of um, the pandemic. Right? We're, we're in an uncharted territory in 2023. Many of you guys are probably feeling the strain of high interest rates, macroeconomic, geopolitical instability, um, you know, and you have essentially this plateau that we're on. Um, but we essentially need to get to that next X-curve. Right? And, and ultimately, we're seeing what I would think is one of the most tremendous accelerations of capability that's going to push technology, capability, competency to the edge of your organizations. And really, if you think about what that is, it's, it's a paradigm shift in technology. Um, and these come, come along every, every decade or so, right? The, probably the last biggest one was, was mobile, right? As I mentioned, in terms of just a huge leap change in terms of capability, innovation, whole new industries being open. Um, and we're at the beginning of a new S-curve, right? And that S-curve, and you guys have talked about it, is um, artificial intelligence, especially uh, uh, generative AI. So, you know, it's maybe a little bit cliche to have a quote from Bill Gates when it comes to technology, but he knows a bit about this. Um, and I think he succinctly said that this is going to be a technology capability and evolution that's going to change the world, right? Specifically, this class of generative AI that we're seeing come up. And as Chris had mentioned, um, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to study artificial intelligence. Um, uh, my advisor was part of the Yale AI Laboratory which studied artificial intelligence back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and the methodology that they used there was essentially something called case-based reasoning, uh, strong AI. And, and the methodology there was we have computers, they're powerful, they're strong, but ultimately the representation of the human mind really matters. And so how do you model memory? How do you model analogy? How do you model reasoning? Um, and there's a whole field of something called case-based reasoning that came up. And you'll see that type of technology today. If you guys use WebMD, it's called an expert system because it's essentially using a decision tree behind the scenes. It asks you about your symptoms. It's got a whole bunch of knowledge encoded by doctors and experts who have put information in. Um, and at the end of a set of questions, it'll say, oh, you've got a cold, right? Or, oh, you need to go to the ER. Um, and so those types of systems have been ubiquitous. Um, we've also seen uh, the emergence of neural nets, right? And generative AI is a type of neural net using essentially a model of neurons and synapses in the brain uh, to do large-scale processing on large quantities of data. And it's a fundamentally different paradigm, but it's incredibly powerful, right? So if you take what I learned um, in grad school 20 years ago, and you compare it to what you have today, uh, there's things that you can do today that we only imagine theoretically you could do even 20 years ago, right? And so you guys have probably seen uh, the rise and the reemergence of NVIDIA, GPU processing, being able to do essentially math very, very fast. And then the accessibility to large quantities of data, taking snapshots of the internet, plumbing it into these very sophisticated math models, um, and then coming up with what we see in terms of generative AI. And this is really just a, a paradigm shift, and it's really gonna change the way that we have to think about technology in an enterprise and how to support it from a technology perspective. So if you go back to the slide about the, the macro evolution of technology, we have this next generation that's coming, which is artificial intelligence, and it's really here. And for many of us, ChatGPT looks kind of like magic. If you've played a while with it enough, you're like, holy cow, this is doing things that we never thought were, were really possible. But fundamentally, we've actually seen a lot of this technology being deployed over the last 10 years or so. Um, previous to coming to CDW, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about and working on, on self-driving cars. Um, and there's a lot of heavy machine learning that we were doing, computer vision using neural nets. Um, but it was in a very narrow focus. It was about how do I detect an environment around me, looking at lane lines, looking at stop signs, looking at traffic patterns, and then feeding that information into um, a set of algorithms and routines to help a car drive. What we're seeing today 
is essentially applying that same technology that was using imagery and using it to understand human language at very, very large scale. So it can do things um, that we only kind of dreamt were possible, and now you have companies like OpenAI who are essentially taking technology that has been very kind of well understood but applying it and then opening it up to the world, right? So it's just driving, it's pouring gasoline on this transformation, this acceleration of AI in the workplace. So if we think about AI acceleration and how it impacts kind of what we do, um, there's a couple things that, to keep in mind. You know, now, nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody knows you know, how big of an S-curve this is gonna be, you know, how revolutionary it's gonna be. Is it gonna be the most important technology advancement in the last 100 years? There's people who say that. Is it gonna be like mobile? Maybe, we don't know. There's a couple things that I think are absolutely certain. Uh, one is data, and access to data is gonna be paramount in terms of making these algorithms and these systems work, right? For, a system like ChatGPT or any large language model or frankly any machine learning model, the key ingredient is data, right? It's differentiated data that's tied to a business and its context. It's really great having something like ChatGPT that knows Wikipedia can, essentially it's like a perfect trivia partner, but if you're gonna apply it to something in your business that's specific and bespoke to how you run it, that data and that access to that data is gonna be incredibly, incredibly important. The second thing that we know is gonna be true is that the barrier for entry into technology is gonna go very, very low, right? So many of you probably feel it already, hey, look, I have an organization, I'm deploying tools, you know, the analytics frameworks, toolkits, you know, I have people that are not within my department, a technology organization, who are building reports, potentially using no, low, no-code platforms, you know, building RPA bots. Uh, now, imagine that that barrier for entry gets even lower. Right? You have somebody in the organization who um, has a really good idea, doesn't know how to code, doesn't want to learn how to code, doesn't need to code, uh, who can essentially build a really, really good prototype using a natural language interface. Right? Now, those prototypes that they create are only going to have value if they have access to the data sitting in your infrastructure or understand how to roll the business logic or integrate it into the systems that you already have. So today, you might have 50 developers in the edge in a few months, maybe a year or two, you're gonna have two, three, 10 times as many in your organization who are gonna have good ideas or are now gonna be equipped with the ability to rapidly prototype and essentially write code, right? So what does that mean for the IT organization? It means that there's gonna be huge responsibilities of governing the use of this, making the data accessible, making it safe, making it secure, capturing the derivative data that's coming off of these environments, and it's gonna change the job and it's gonna accelerate the pace of that evolution in terms of IT and digital transformation. And finally, the key use cases, those are the things that matter, right? ChatGPT is a cool toy. It can do some really cool stuff. But ultimately, the use cases that you power in your business and how it applies to your business, how does it make you more efficient? How does it make you stronger? How does it make you more competitive? Um, how does your customer satisfaction go up? Those key use cases are still gonna be critical, right? I always talk to my team, we don't do technology for technology's sake, right? We don't just implement algorithms, we don't implement systems, we do it to drive business outcomes. So that connection between the business outcomes and the application of advanced AI is incredibly important. So the way that we think about it at CDW is how do we um, enable and accelerate this hub and spoke model? And the hub and spoke really means is you have a core within the technology organization, within an IT organization, that's creating fundamental building blocks that can be leveraged anywhere in the organization, right? And it's really about not governance, it's not about control, it's not about saying, hey, if you want something built, you gotta come to IT and get in line. It's about how do I create the fundamental Lego bricks that you can assemble in the organization that can help accelerate you. And now with ChatGPT and generative AI, that is only gonna accelerate more. You're gonna have way more demand in your organization for people wanting to get access to data. So they're gonna say, hey, I have this great idea. All I need is a list of all the customers that we have. How do I get that, right? You're gonna have people who are gonna say, I want to be uh, able to have a customer use this, so how do I get access to login authentication services in the business? From an IT perspective, you're gonna say, gosh, I wanna make sure this stuff is secure, right? Chris was joking about AI that kind of can run wild, but you can imagine a scenario where um, if you don't know what you're doing, you could potentially introduce a security vulnerability. You can open up a port that you didn't expect to be opened, right? That's not caught by your firewall. So there's a lot of risk involved when you start having more and more people in the organization who are developing technology using this type of platform. So at CDW, we think about 
these building blocks. And we actually do it in the context of how we build our own products. Uh, so my team, in addition to uh, running kind of enterprise IT, uh, we do product development work. So cdw.com, we have some innovative products that we're developing. As we develop them, we build these building blocks. So we essentially say, okay, we need to redo our customer identity access and management platform. Let's essentially make sure it's wrapped in a microservice, we have nice documentation, it's APIs. If there's somebody else in the organization that wants to tap into it, let's make it as easy as possible. Let's make it self-serve. So these building blocks become very, very important. And what I've done here is I've listed just a few of them that I think are pretty much core and fundamental to a business doing any sort of transaction. So you have uh, infrastructure. How do you give access to infrastructure to spin up, uh, to spin down, to be able to scale up uh, and make sure that you can run workloads in an efficient way. Login authentication security. You know, these are the things that'll keep almost everybody up who has cybersecurity responsibility up at night, right? Which is, you have more and more people wanna get access to content, wanna do things, wanna potentially mutate data to put assets back into the enterprise. Uh, how do you make sure that's all secure? How do you enable the organization without introducing risk to the enterprise? Master data management. This thing is like so important. It's like sometimes maybe the driest thing we talk about, but it's essentially master data management and how do you control, centralize, and govern your data assets. As I said, machine learning data is they require data, machine learning algorithms, right? And you know, you've heard the adage, garbage in, garbage out. Neural nets can't fix bad data, right? And if you have data in your organization and it's ungoverned and it's sprawling everywhere and you know, your customer count versus your customer count is different, you can't operate a business that way. So having really solid master data management, but then also having the infrastructure and the connections to utilize that data in a programmatic way, right? I've been in a lot of organizations and I've heard that data gets passed around on spreadsheets, right? That can't happen in a world where you're rapidly iterating, you wanna have core sources of truth and you wanna drive value to the business. User experience, style guides, and design. Still important. You might have machines that can do things that they couldn't do a few years ago, but the design and the human element is always gonna be important, right? It's still unclear in terms of the automation impact, in terms of how many jobs could potentially be impacted by this technology, but at the end of the day, humans are still gonna be in the loop. How do you design these systems so they can interact with them? They're designed in a way that are consistent, coherent, easy to use, um, so you can actually get more value across the organization. And then finally, the AI and the ML models. There's a lot of love and care and tuning and training that go into AI and ML models. And many times those could be reused across the organizations. How do you govern? How do you store those? How do you make those available? Um, as well as the machinery in terms of machine learning operations to ensure that you have consistency, reusability of these components. So these are not an exhaustive list of building blocks, but these are things that maybe you would have thought about even before ChatGPT was announced, right? This is a natural evolution that is taking a playbook out of what we've seen in a lot of the leading platform software companies. You know, this set of building blocks, you go to an Amazon, you go to a Meta, you go to a Google, they have this because ultimately they're creating products and they're trying to enable product development. If you come from a traditional company that's doing manufacturing, that's doing retail, this same playbook works. It's only gonna be accelerated now by these advancements in AI. Um, so it's incredibly, incredibly important that we think about enabling at the hub this capability for your organization. So we're at the beginning of this fundamental leap. And if you look at productivity and cost, you know, starting at the left, you know, the expensive old school IT department, that's gone, right? Where there's only a set of people who can do the work, um, very, very high cost, takes a lot of time. We're rapidly moving to the right, right? And what we see is gonna happen in the next couple years is the empowerment of the user. Right? And what you need to move from is essentially a, a model of domain expertise where IT is a castle that kind of has everything under lock and key. Uh, and you need to figure out a way of essentially moving that to the edge of the organization and enabling your infrastructure to be plugged into these advanced algorithms and advanced capabilities and really unleash the creativity of those people in the organization who are aligned business and essentially interacting with customers, interacting with products every single day. And so as that shift goes from left to right, you're gonna see production increase, you're gonna see costs go down, you're gonna see time to market go down. But ultimately, the role of IT is gonna be how do you enable that? You know, how do you pour the rocket fuel into that engine, which is your organization? It's the people, it's the infrastructure, and ultimately, it's gonna be how do you use these algorithms in order to scale your business, right? So it's a very, very exciting time ahead. Um, you know, and I've, like, you know, I've seen this um, 
AI landscape now for, for 20 plus years, uh, but seeing the advancements and the pace of those advancements over the last year, um, it's pretty astounding, right? So this is a wave that's coming. You know, is it gonna be like the cloud wave in 2015 where, oh my gosh, everything is gonna change? Um, and it did, right? But you also saw a balance between on-prem, between cloud, now we talk a lot about hybrid. Um, I feel very much that this is gonna be a game changer for everybody in this room, right? And ultimately, it's how do you think smart about this and how do you ride the wave to enablement um, without taking unnecessary risk for the business? Because there are pitfalls in this technology. It's not, it's not bulletproof, um, it will make mistakes, um, it is prone to all the same things that machine learning algorithms are prone to, bias, a lack of emotional intelligence, a lack of explainability, um, um, an, an issue with debugging. Um, so there are gonna be risks there, but the opportunity outweighs those risks. And it's really how you're gonna position this technology within an organization um, to be really, really effective. So I'm, I'm super excited about this, and um, Chris, I know you're gonna come up and we're gonna just do a little chat now, but uh, you know, thank you all, and would love to answer any questions that you have. Well, thank you. Yeah, it is an amazing amount to think about. In fact, yesterday morning when Jill and I were here, we talked about data, and you just said something, um, you know, core sources of truth, and getting to that, that is still a fundamental, fundamental challenge. Yep. But it kind of brings me to question one. So I think everybody's probably thinking, well, this is great, I completely agree, but it's getting started. It's right, where's the genesis point? for my organization in my vertical or whatever I, I tackle, how do I get started? Maybe a few nuggets from you there would help. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really understanding those key use cases. Like, I mean, off the shelf, um, some of this technology, whether it's, with, whether it's BARD, whether it's um, ChatGPT, there's, there's a certain set of things that it does really well that can just help people in everyday work, right? Whether it's summarizing meeting notes, whether it's drafting an initial email, whether it's um, doing some initial research. Mm -hmm. um, those are use cases. So if you, know, if you guys haven't used it yet and played around with it, um, a lot of people I've talked to are like, hey, have you played with it? And they're like, yeah, I tried, and I got this big notice saying that it was too busy and the servers were too busy, so I kind of stopped using it. Um, I would encourage you guys to go just, just do a couple use cases, right? And you'll find out that um, it can do a lot of stuff that will just shave time off your day there's a lot of things that it can't do, right? And so you can't expect it to be kind of the panacea to save everything, right? But it, it can be a, a real legitimate time saver. Mm -hmm. um, and, and ultimately for me, the, the brainstorming part of it is the most useful. So if you're to start somewhere, you guys have all you know, opened up an email or opened up a Word document, you're staring at that cursor just blinking, right? And you're like, gosh, how do I even start this thing, right? Use ChatGPT to give you to give it a prompt and just start with at least something to, to get the juices flowing, right? And that's where I would start. There's Issues around privacy that I think people are struggling with. There's a Samsung report that came out just a couple days ago, if you guys read that, where um, you had essentially developers in Samsung who were taking proprietary code um, and, and essentially feeding it to ChatGPT to essentially write test cases or to find uh, bugs in the code, right? Now, there's huge issues with security, right, in terms of being able to provide that. Now, while ChatGPT will say, hey, look, we don't take those inputs and we don't use them to retrain the algorithms, um, they do store those prompts for 30 days, right? They use it for QA purposes. Um, so, you know, every company out there, unless you've blocked it on your firewall, which I would probably say you shouldn't because people will get, out, get around right. that, um, are using it today, right? They're gonna be using ChatGPT, they're gonna be doing things with it. Uh, many of them are gonna be benign. Hey, I just wanna, I want a thought starter for an email. Um, some of it may pose risk to the enterprise, right? And so the approach that we're taking is how do we educate the organization on the proper use of this technology, how does it align with the code and conduct policies that we have already internally. Um, but ultimately, we're not gonna block it, we're gonna figure out how to train people to use it in a way that is really, really effective in a general sense, and then start looking at very specific use cases, of how can we integrate this technology into our workflows, right? That's less of a, hey, I have a prompt and I'm gonna type to it and talk to it, it's more, how do I automate a process that's potentially connecting an ERP and a CRM and a CPQ where can that help? You know, can I use it within my hiring processes, right? And that becomes more of a use case specific, very thoughtful approach of how you integrate it versus it being just a, another tool that you deploy to the enterprise. It, it's interesting, we were yesterday, we were chatting about automation, right? And finding places to level up individuals and maybe take, you know, mundane tasks off and, and do that. Clearly that's an area this can exploit. As an example, I've looked, uh, 
ChatGPT inside of Excel, for those that are still using Excel for some manual processes, which we're not gonna get away from that immediately in the next few years, there are some incredible things that it can do. Because if you've ever seen there's, you know, the PhD people in Excel, letting ChatGPT do some incredible things with pivot tables and whatnot could be an interesting first step to accelerating some of those automation processes, right? To, to automate. So yeah, there are so many opportunities. I'm Absolutely, curious. that's actually a third class, right? So if you think yeah. about, you know, the, the way that we think about kind of the classes, it's, uh, um, it's, it's what we call vanilla chat GPT, just out of the box. How do you, how do you give people access to it in a, in a safe manner, right? And you have companies out there now who are saying, hey, look, we'll create a private instance. You know, whatever you put into it won't get into the public domain. You know, that's an avenue you can go down. You have the integration of chat GPT through the open, uh, through APIs into your workflows. And then you have finally the, the use case you saw, which is, Every single SaaS company out there is now going to is announcing roadmaps where they're going to integrate it. So, yeah. Copilot, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a new product from Microsoft. I mean, those of you who code have seen Copilot being used within GitHub, right, for for months now, right? My my wife is actually a college professor at Northwestern. She teaches computer science, and a year ago, she's like, "Let me show you this Copilot. They're using generative AI to essentially generate code within." Um, within the GitHub environment. And for her, you know, she was already struggling with issues around, should we allow our students to use this? That's an interesting point. It's kind, of yeah. a, it's kind of a shortcut for them to just generate code without having to think about it. And you know, we had a discussion back and forth, and we are like, they're gonna use it. This stuff is like, you can't, That's right. it's almost yeah. like Google comes out with the search box and you tell everybody, well, you can't use it. Well, no, it's a tool now. Everybody's gonna use it. So how do you put it into your workflow and make sure that it's, it's beneficial? Yeah, I mean, actually the human factor, the more you say don't, the more they will. Absolutely. I mean, it's just gonna, it's literally gonna be the opposite. It. I can't imagine the conversations at the suit house. That's another topic. We don't have the time, but Mostly that's don't, something don't I think we should do a breakout on yeah. later. Okay. <laughs> um, speaking of you know getting started, just to make it maybe even a little more resolute, who would you pick in your organization, or who are the right people to initially kind of tap? Yeah. How do you, how do you find the initial adopters to trust to start testing sort of the system? To, to give ideas then and feed them up to executives yeah. like yourself. Yeah, so we have a, a set of ideas. Like, you know, I think there's a tops down, bottoms up approach that we're, we're applying. So, you know, I sat down with a couple of the smartest folks on my team and we, we did a little bit of hallucinating, right? I, I like using that word, but just hallucinating, you know, what are the use cases? What are the things that we're struggling with today? We're in the middle of a digital transformation. There's a lot of work ahead of us. Where could this technology potentially help us, right? And coming up with, you know, here are a set of use cases bucketed from, Basic, hey, this could help every, everybody from a productivity perspective to, hey, imagine we fed this data set to ChatGPT and it could do this, mm -hmm. to integrating it. So we have a set of ideas. Uh, we're also working on a way of essentially doing the grounds up approach. Because okay. you know, I think you know, we know that people are using it within our enterprise today. I mean, I've looked at the firewall logs and people are using it, right? I'm sure they have a million awesome ideas that we didn't even think of, right? So how do we do a little bit of crowdsourcing bottoms up? Yep. Um, and then how do we make those best practices, right? If you think about, um, you know, recipes, I've been mm -hmm. thinking about that, which is how do you create a, um, a, a, a community within the organization for coworkers to share their recipes? Hey, I, have, I found this, this hack of how to use this technology, be able to write it up and then publish it, right? People can vote them up and down, they can share, they can talk about it. It, it essentially promotes a community of practice. So if people found a really good way to use it, let's share it. Right? And then let's also have top-down use cases. You know? And what you don't want to do is you don't want to try boiling the ocean. There's a million things that you could potentially do. Mm -hmm. Focus on where the biggest business value is going to be. So you know, my next step is um, the bottoms up, the tops down from a technology perspective, but then also sitting with my major business stakeholders mm -hmm. right? and saying, okay, what are you guys doing day to day in terms of pain? And right. where could this potentially help? And then publish a roadmap to the organization so they understand what's coming and what to expect. Um, and that includes things that we're going to integrate ourselves. It's going to be when do we get access to the Copilot beta, for example, from mm -hmm. Office, uh, from Microsoft. Um, you know, and having that as something that we're constantly drumbeating, educating the organization, and showing them what's next. I like that idea. You know, whether it's a wiki or a SharePoint site or something where people can kind of free flow and publish, but then ultimately vet it against the business and, and figure that out. And that's going to be ever evolving as it as it evolves. So, great point. Um, so I think another thing is, okay, this is the flavor. I mean, clearly we think it's here to stay, but I mean, is it? Yeah. Or do you see another disruption? I mean, how committed, I guess, if you're, if we're, if you're sitting here, how committed to this should you be? Um, 
you should be committed to it. It's, it's, there will be a hype cycle, right? Now, you know, the question is, is the magnitude of that S curve, right? Is this, is this bigger than the mobile revolution? Is it bigger than the cloud? We don't know. There will be an S curve, right? And so the question is, is how do you um, go in with enough kind of foresight, innovation, experimentation mm -hmm. without being like, oh my gosh, this is gonna end everything. Like everything, let's move all our chips into this and you know, figure out how to excel. I mean, you gotta find the balance, yeah. right? And it's gonna be your risk appetite, it's gonna be your ability to invest, to innovate, um, and ultimately to drive change, right? Because you know, this is a tool, right? At the end of the day, there's humans involved, there's processes that are ingrained in an organization. This doesn't solve it. Just like if you licensed, um, I don't know, a SaaS platform and you expect that, hey, I'm, I'm gonna install it and all of a sudden everything's gonna be great. That's not reality, right? That's part of the problem. You now have to get the business to adopt it. You have to get the processes changed. It's the same thing with this. Uh, at least my view is that it's here to stay. It's gonna drive um, a new wave of innovation um, that is going, to, um, is going to be very exciting to see. There's gonna be a lot of investment. Every single board, every single executive team is gonna talk about it. Um, they're gonna be asking you, if you're not part of that board, hey, what's your take on it? How are we enabling it? Um, you know, my view is, um, you know, be cautious in terms of implementation and investment, but be aware that this is a, this is this is real. I mean, this is a yeah. game changer for for many industries, um, and you've seen its benefits specifically. In, and I'm talking about deep learning technology. Has you've seen it actually um, already change the world, like mm -hmm. over the last several years, as these neural nets have been scaled for specific purposes. You know, the fact that your car today, even though it's not fully self-driving, if you have a newer car, it can keep you within lane lines, that's a neural net, right? That's essentially finding the lane lines and centering you there, right? In, in most advanced use cases. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at um, a combination of what NVIDIA has been doing with deep learning for image processing, right? Yeah. Image generation. Um, we're gonna start seeing this kind of pervasive, but there's, you know, as I mentioned, a whole lot of risk with this technology. And, you know, one of the things that's gonna be a bit of a wild card is, the legislation that's gonna be created yeah. around how do you govern this, right? You know, as I talked about, the data is king. For the most part, these systems are just essentially sucking up all the internet, right? So, you know, what are the copyright laws gonna look like when you're creating derivative works off of others, other people's work without attribution? Yeah. Um, you know, you- Yeah, written audio, written audio. Vi pictures, video, I mean, it's- Yeah, I don't know if, who, who here, you know, you know, there's a, was it, uh, uh, I don't know if it's always just rappers, but uh, Dr. Dre and Eminem, you know, people are essentially generating their voice, writing lyrics for them, and then selling new music. I better right. scratch like that a, off. That's like a crazy course. slippery slope, right? And so, yeah. uh, you know, we see a lot of, um, you know, from a geopolitical global perspective, we see a lot of caution, you know, in, the, in, in Europe, yeah. right, in, in Asia, sure. uh, you know, both in terms of privacy, but also copyright. So that's gonna be a bit of a wild card on how that's regulated. Um, but, you know, I think the, the future is incredibly bright and it's gonna, like I said, this, this new wave of innovation and we're just at that bottom of that S-curve and we're early days. Uh, but it's something that I think everybody needs to think about in terms of how you're gonna leverage this technology in maybe small ways, mm -hmm. maybe larger ways. Uh, but, you know, there's not a lot of downside to starting small now. That's what I was gonna say, st start small and don't get overwhelmed by it and find a couple use cases that actually deliver value. Exactly. And, and speaking of that, you know, Joe and I yesterday, we, we started off talking about how important it is to have the relationship, you know, that olive branch between IT and the business. And I think, you know, the majority of the audience here are in, on IT, right, on, on your side. And how, I'm curious if you could, you know, sort of the, our last topic, Sometimes you have to extend that olive branch a little more. Sometimes Jill, right, and, and her peers have to extend that a little more. How, how do you view that? And you know, the whole topic here of this conference is keeping holistic IT kind of one foot in both sides, future, current. How do you, how do you see that and how do you do that? It's an absolute partnership mm -hmm. um, between technology and the business. And you know, Jill and I uh, had a huge opportunity and, and really my, you know, a huge benefit for me coming into the organization, being able to, uh, pair up with Jill in terms of rolling out Salesforce to the organization, right? And, and we've had a lot of success in that program in the last year and a half of deploying it to all um, our sales teams in, in America and in, in uh, the U.S. Uh, Canada's coming next. But that was a, it was like a true partnership. Her and I were in every single meeting. 
you know, on a weekly basis with the uh, implementation delivery teams, with the SI, with the business stakeholders, um, really sending a unified message down, right? It wasn't IT coming in and imposing a new system. It wasn't sales coming in and micromanaging the technology development. It was a true partnership. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think the thing that I'm trying to do more of is, you know, how do I, um, how do I understand the day in the life of the seller, kind of our front line, yeah. and understand what are the things that are gonna accelerate them. So this is that whole notion of we don't do technology for the sake of technology, we do it to drive business outcomes. Those business outcomes are gonna happen in many ways outside of IT for those who are interacting with the products, with the customers, with the partners. In our job, at least what I see my job at CDW is how do I, um, how do I make our coworkers the best that they can be by taking technology and making it their superpower? Right? How does that give them a competitive edge so when they're out in the field serving customers, you know, making those industries as, as good as they can, um, technology becomes that thing that is a bit of an X factor that helps them do things better than the comp competition. Right? And, yep. and ultimately, the, the, tech, the, the business has to tell me that, and I have to partner with them, and I have to understand it. Um, and then, you know, as we talked about this acceleration of moving this to the edge, is how do I equip those that want to build technology or operate technology or plug into the core, how do I give them the, the right governance, the right training, the right guardrails, the right sandboxes, the right enablement, the right APIs, the right protocols, the right processes, the right procedures, uh, so they can go fast. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. We're giving them the Lego blocks. They're putting a little super glue here and there. We're helping them, um, and they make that um, something that they own and they drive and we support it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like anything we, we talked about, you you have to commit to working on that because sometimes you have to deliver tough news. Sometimes you get tough news delivered to you, budget or otherwise, right, and constraints, and uh, you have you have to work through those. So I can imagine you're, uh, we get to see the emails, so the progress is amazing. I always joke, even said, oh, Benji's email box must be, the, you know, the, the folders just keep getting added to, even when you take one off the bottom, there's always another ask, but prioritizing that's key. Prioritizing, yep. so, yeah. Well, thank you so much yep. for, for coming, sharing everything, and uh, I'm sure you'll be mobbed uh, at the break. Everybody, this is your ChatGPT uh, guy here, and WebMD, which I used, by the way, because of this the Lula and Adi's problem <laughs> uh, earlier. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. All right.